Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in. Set aside an hour to join me in the reading of the book, Code Word Barbalon, 666, Danger in the Vatican, the Sons of Loyola and Their Plans for World Domination by P.D. Stewart here on LibertyRadioLive.com. We're going to begin Chapter 25 of the book, Code Word Barbalon. If you're reading along in your copy, and by the way, if you don't have a copy of this book yet, shame on you. This is probably... <laughs> one of the most important, if not the most important book to come out of late about the Vatican Jesuit-led New World Order. Now, I've become quite a pitch man for this book, and I want to <laughs> I want to inform the listeners right now that I have no pecuniary interest with P.D. Stewart or Lux Verbi books. I simply highly recommend this book. And if you don't have a copy yet, by all means, go to www.luxverbi.org and order your copy of this book today. Get two copies and share one with someone who will put it to good use. That's L-U-X-V-E-R-B-I dot O-R-G. Learn along with me and the rest of the listeners about the Vatican Jesuit-led New World Order. Now, many of you know as we've talked about repeatedly on the broadcast, and it always bears repeating, that in 1773, by a papal bull, this author calls it a brief, the Jesuit order were suppressed and extinct. Their properties were confiscated and given to other uh, Catholic orders, and the world for the first time since it, the founding of the Jesuits thought they were rid forever of the Jesuits. Roman Catholic countries all over Europe were sick and tired of Jesuit meddling in governments, assassinations of kings, the fomentation of wars. And they simply demanded that the Jesuits be stopped. And it required a papal bull by Pope Clement the Fourteenth to do it. This again occurred in 1773. Now we're going to talk about what happened after that suppression. The title of this chapter is Ruling Through the Bavarian Illuminati. Now, many people instantly, when they hear the word Illuminati, they automatically dismiss you as a conspiracy theorist kook. But the Illuminati is very real, and this author writes about it. It begins this chapter with a quote from Sun Tzu in his Art of War. Listen to what he says. The general will know how to shape at will not only the army he is commanding, but also that of his enemies. Art, The Art of War was written by a Chinese warrior, named Sun Tzu, and it's considered by some to be the most erudite dissertation on war there is. We first heard about the Sun Tzu and his art of war on Inquisition Update back when we were reading and discussing the book Rulers of Evil by F. Tupper Saucy. So I'm glad to know that this author, too, is familiar with Sun Tzu and his art of war. He begins the chapter by saying, It is the 18th century, and the Jesuits have launched a massive salvo, their most audacious campaign yet for world domination. On May 1st, 1776, a high satanic holiday, was the beginning of a new phase for the Roman Catholic Church, a phase that would have reverberations around the world for decades to come. On that date, a German Jesuit by the name of Dr. Adam Weishaupt founded a secret revolutionary society called the Illuminaten Ordens, or the Order of the Illuminati, based at the Jesuit University in Ingolstadt, Bavaria. 
So there is the foundation, a Jesuit priest, and he'll make it further clear that he was a professor of canon law at Ingolstadt. And he patterned this Illuminati order after the model of the Jesuit order. Now that's a quote from uh, Johann Jacob Herzog and Philip Schaff. And by the way, while I'm reading this book, I don't always cite the sources. But this, this book is just covered with sources, direct sources that he quotes. And that's why this book is so important to get, because it, can, it, it includes the sources of all this valuable information so that it can be researched by you and backed up. Okay, highly uh, resourced book. And it's all available right here in the footnotes on each page, so they're they're easily referred to. Now, the, the Bavarian Illuminati, created by a Jesuit priest at a Jesuit university, Ingolstadt University, was patterned after the model of the Jesuit order. Okay, now Weishaupt adopted the code name Spartacus, that he used for himself, and he took it after a slave who led an uprising against the Roman legions. What significance that is, I'm not quite certain, but maybe he'll, maybe the author will make us clear why uh, he chose the particular name Spartacus, especially a name associated with rel- rebellion against Rome. Although, if you're a regular listener to Inquisition Update, you probably realize by now that uh, the Jesuit order is in rebellion against the papacy on on occasions and have actually killed popes. So maybe Spartacus is a a proper uh, alias for Adam Weishaupt. Anyway, prior to the the suppression of the Jesuits in 1773, the the degree of power that the members of the Society of Jesus had attained in the German state of Bavaria was almost absolute. All right, Bavaria was a Jesuit-controlled state. It was by them, the Jesuits, that the majority of the Bavarian colleges were founded. Okay, that's the natural first step of the Jesuits. Whenever they go into a land, they begin to establish universities. That's the recruiting ground for Jesuits. They they pick the cream of the intellectual crop in every country where they are, put them through their Jesuit indoctrinations in their colleges, and then make Jesuit priests and Jesuit coadjutors out of them to serve their purpose of controlling that country and any other country in which they uh, in in which they uh, occupy. Okay. It was by them that the majority of the Bavarian colleges were founded, and that is certainly why eventually they got full control of Bavaria. And it says, and it was by them they were controlled by the Jesuits that the that the uh, Bavarian government was controlled. All right, and so it's not surprising that they would use their most renowned university to launch their comeback after their suppression. It's a fact that even before the the Pope canonically restored the Jesuits in 1814, the Society of Jesus had already been scheming a return to power. As indicated above, the date of the Illuminati's launch appears to be uh, appears to have occult significance as May 1st is the satanic holiday Sabbath called Beltane, one of the most important nights on the satanic calendar when a human sacrifice is required, which is an, a, a mockery of the death of Jesus Christ. That's how they they see this this uh, human sacrifice, a mockery of the killing of Christ. Remember, we talked about earlier uh, the the letters on the crucifix of the Roman Catholic Church, and it's even stated this in the Jesuit Oath. The letters I-N-R-I, the familiar letters I-N-R-I, that are always seen in Roman Catholic churches posted 
uh, uh, at the top of the cross of the crucifix in the Roman Catholic Church is the letters I-N-R-I, which stand for Eustum, Necker, Regis, and Pius. It is lawful to kill or annihilate heretical princes, kings, and rulers. That's what it stands for. And it is a literal mockery. Now, obviously, the laity of the Roman Catholic Church have taught another interpretation of those four letters, I-N-R-I, but the Jesuit oath makes it perfectly clear their interpretation of the letters, and it's simply a mockery of Christ's crucifixion. Was not Christ, according to Jesuit thinking, an heretical prince, kingdom, or ruler? Yes, he is the prince, the prince of peace. He's the king of the kingdom of Israel, the heavenly kingdom, New Jerusalem, and he's a ruler. Every eye shall see him and every knee shall bow. But the Jesuits make mockery of him on every Roman Catholic crucifix. And they allow the laity to believe whatever's officially taught by the Roman Catholic Church. But in the Jesuit mind, it is a mockery of the crucifixion of Christ. They do not receive him as Christ. Their Christ, their Savior, their leader, the one who gives them their power and seat and authority in the world is the dragon, Satan himself. And that's why occultic dates are valuable to them. Okay, and that's why May 1st, the, the, the date of Beltane, was uh, an important date in Jesuit history. Now, it says the founder of the Illuminati was born the son of a Jewish rabbi. Adam Weishaupt was the son of a Jewish rabbi. He was born on February 6, 1748. He was made to convert to Catholicism in 1753, the year his father died, when he was adopted by his godfather, Baron Johann Adam von Ickstadt, a director at the Jesuit University of Ingolstadt. The young orphan's education was thereafter entrusted to the care of the Jesuits of that great university. Of a brilliant mind and well-trained in the Jesuit arts of equivocation and probabilism, Weishaupt, at the age of 25, was promoted to the prestigious position of professor of canon law. So he is a professor of the law of the Pope. Now, just to interject, I don't want to confuse the issue, but I want you to realize that canon law is simply Rome's replacement for God's holy law. It is not God who they honor in their canon law. It is the Pope and Satan who they honor in Roman Catholic canon law. Now, the laity are not told this, but the, the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church surely understand that they are in complete rebellion against Christ, and they are on this wor- they are in this world to create a counterfeit so-called Christian kingdom, a universal kingdom for the papacy. That's what the Jesuits were created for, and that they have been about that business ever since their creation in 1543. So understand that he is a Jesuit. He is creating a secret society into which the the suppressed Jesuits may go underground and continue their their work. Okay, he was a professor of Roman Catholic canon law, and as a favored protege of von Ickstadt, he would later become professor of moral theology, that is, Roman Catholic moral theology at Ingolstadt, which university had a long tradition in that dangerous and pernicious subject. Dangerous and pernicious is Roman Catholic moral theology. And if you doubt that, just get a hold of uh, any theologia moralis, any uh, uh, moral theology 
by any of the great so-called doctors of the Roman Catholic Church and prepare to be stunned at what they teach by way of morality. Now, he continues, he says, The reader will notice that I have referred to Weishaupt as a Jesuit rather than an ex-Jesuit, which is how most historians and commentators label him. That, of course, has been the accepted view, but in this chapter, I'd like to proffer an alternative perspective, one that will explain a lot of what has mystified the historians and commentators alike. I wish to propose a radically different hypothesis altogether, which is simply this, that Adam Weishaupt, for all his public attacks on the Jesuits, never left the order. In fact, Weishaupt was merely a talisman, a demon, okay, a talisman. Look it up. Find out what a talisman is. People wear talismans, religious objects, uh, pendants or necklaces around their necks, and in a state of crisis, rather than making prayer to their lawful intercessor in heaven, Christ Jesus, they clutch their talisman. It's idolatry, okay? But it's a holy object, a holy relic, or some other thing worn about the neck that is to give one protection against so-called evil, okay? And Weishaupt is described as a mere talisman. Now, A Jesuit in Disguise is the subtitle for this next section. He says, I say Adam Weishaupt remained a Jesuit for the following cogent reasons. First, the term ex-Jesuit is misleading, as all Jesuits after 1773 were called ex-Jesuits, since no Jesuit was allowed openly uh, to act as, as such following the decree of the suppression. At the time Weishaupt revived the Illuminati, the Jesuits had only recently been banned, uh, been banned from teaching, and all their college were, colleges were taken over under the famous bull or brief of Clement XIV. Even in Germany, where the Jesuits were for a time permitted to teach, they were only allowed to do so as subordinates and not as superiors. Weishaupt, in order to retain his professorship at Ingolstadt, declared himself as having left the Jesuits, even claiming to be their enemy. Because of the terms of Pope Clement's bull, had Weishaupt not disowned his allegiance to the Jesuits, he would not have been able to retain his professorship at Ingolstadt. Now, the official yawn given about this is that the Jesuits were sorely offended with Weishaupt following his appointment, as professor of civil law at Ingolstadt in 1772, and it says in parentheses before they were even suppressed, and more so by his later appointment as professor of canon law in 1773, the very year the Jesuit order had been banned. Incredibly, it is said, that for these trifling reasons he got into a quarrel with the Jesuits and left the order renouncing his oath and his vows, and thus becoming the bitterest, the quote-unquote bitterest enemy, as Professor Robison declares. However, notwithstanding my indebtedness to and the respect for the, the research of Professor Robison, his analysis on this one, uh, on this one point is, in my opinion, much too simple and does not reconcile with the facts. So, the thesis of P.D. Stewart is that all of this pretended animosity between Adam Weishaupt and the Jesuit was the Jesuit order was merely for human consumption so that Adam Weishaupt would be free of suspicion in his activities at Jesuit Ingolstadt University and his creation of the, the Illuminati. He continued to operate as a Jesuit. All right. What Weishaupt, who uh, every credible historian admits, was not only educated as a Jesuit priest, but actually founded his Illuminati order after the hierarchical model of the Society of Jesus, according to their constitutions. 
okay, and would have become their bitterest enemy simply on account of some fallout over his professorship at Ingolstadt seems to me to be quite ludicrous. Had Weishaupt really hated the Jesuits that much, he would not have used their constitutions, which are the essence of Jesuitism. Additionally, we know that Weishaupt entered into an intrigue with the Jesuit professor Stadler to obtain a coveted ecclesiastical position for the, for, uh, for the latter. Further, Weishaupt did not leave the Jesuit order as the order did not officially exist. It had already been banned in 1773, and the Jesuit general was in prison. Remember, that was uh, uh, General Ritchie was placed in uh, prison. And this resulting in a sharp setback to their policies, so we're told. Now, it says, so there was nothing to leave as such. In any event, one would have thought that the appointment of one of their brethren should have been a cause for rejoicing that a member of the Jesuit order was still allowed to teach at a time when the order itself was officially banned from doing so. Moreover, the Catholic online encyclopedia confirms that even after the Jesuit order was suppressed, quote, some of the ex-Jesuits retained their professorships for a while longer, unquote, yet were not, told, were not told that any of these ex-Jesuits got into quarrels with their former order or became the enemies of the society. Do you suppose it's because it didn't happen? That's right. Thus, the idea of them being angry at Weishaupt for continuing as a professor at Ingolstadt, resulting in bitterness between them and him, is just too simplistic and incredulous to my mind, says P.D. Stewart. In fact, Ingolstadt was founded by Peter de Haunt, also known as Peter Ganesius, who lived from 1521 to 1597, the first German Jesuit, says the author, and the Jesuits had their uh, had held virtually all professorship at, at all professorships, excuse me, at Engelstadt for over 90 years. So the Jesuits were well established at Engelstadt. Indeed, in 1688, the teaching in the Faculty of Philosophy at Ingolstadt passed entirely into the hands of the Jesuit professors. Weishaupt was the first made uh, was first made a professor there in 1772 before the Jesuits were banned in 73. Thus, there was no reason whatsoever for any ill feelings over Weishaupt's appointment, since Ingolstadt has not only been a Jesuit stronghold, but also. Weishaupt was already professor in that institution in 1772. Even more ridiculous is the proposition that merely an account of this petty and puerile quarrel, which claim we've already debunked, and for no other reason, Weishaupt not only came to hate the Jesuits, but more, he now sought for no apparent reason to destroy his own church. How could Weishaupt even imagine that with a few friends, if the official story is to believe that he could possibly overturn the mighty Roman Catholic Church, trust me, they merely took a dive so that they could rise in later rounds to fight for the finish, and that's what they're doing today. You're listening to Inquisition Update on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. We'll be right back. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on satellite, internet, or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, 
we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using Scripture to interpret Scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. Okay, welcome back to Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. Now, we're proposing a very tricky scheme by the Jesuits during their suppression to maintain their survival. They've used a Jesuit at a Jesuit university to form an underground. But in other in order to throw the hounds off their path, they put forth a public appearance that Adam Weishaupt was a traitor to the Jesuit order, that he hated the Jesuit order. Now let me point out something else unique about the Jesuit order. They always create their own opposition. Imagine if you will you're in a debate. You're you're posed to be in a debate. And you must win the debate at all cost. So you go hounding around the neighborhood for someone to debate an issue with you and pay him to lose the debate. To put up a good fight, but in the end take a dive. That's basically what the Jesuits do. They create their own opposition. They control their own opposition. Adam Weishaupt appeared to be, for all intents and purposes, stiff opposition, a traitor of the Jesuit order. Never would one suspect that Adam Weishaupt was all the time working for the Jesuit order, but he was. And he created the, the Illuminati as an underground for the Jesuits so that they could continue their diabolical work in the world. They used a Jew to do this, by the way. 
very significant. Rome, the Vatican, the Jesuits always put a Jew in the place to take blame because they hate the Jews. They teach replacement theology, that it was the Jews who killed Christ and that it that that there's some sort of global Jewish conspiracy, which is thoroughly thoroughly debunked by Daniel the prophet in the second chapter of Daniel, and so vividly uh, pointed out by Nicholas when he was a guest on my program that there are only two be- uh, four beasts depicted there: Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and then finally Rome. There's not a fifth empire of a Jew, of the Jews. But Rome counts on people not being thoroughly educated in the Bible. Rome persecutes the Bible and Bible believers and puts out her own gospel and her own Bibles and teaches from her pulpits Jesuit lies and hoping that the world will pick up their their propaganda that the Jews are secretly trying to rule the world when in fact it is the Jesuits, a Roman entity fully consistent with what is clearly taught by the prophet Daniel. So is there a global Jewish conspiracy? No. Nope, it's not in God's book. If we believe God and we believe his book, there is no Jewish global conspiracy. There is a Roman global conspiracy. It's called the New World Order, and the Jesuits are the vanguard, the the shock troops, the special agent for the Pope. And it is through them that he has achieved world domination. Adam Weishaupt was just an accessory to that to that effort. Adam Weishaupt and his Jesuit order made sure that Jesuitism continued to fight for the great the grand design of global Vatican Jesuit led New World Order. Now, P.D. Stewart continues, he says, we must also ask why a well to do professor with everything going for him, apart from his alleged fallout with the Jesuits, would not only attack the Jesuits, but would suddenly turn against his church and also against the whole world, devising a plan to overturn, quote, all governments and establishments. Only a deranged individual would dream up such a grand and vengeful plan for no greater reason than a dispute with his former brethren over an appointment as a professor at Ingolstadt University. On the, cron- on the contrary, the very fact that he now hated his church is consistent with him remaining a member of an underground Jesuit movement rather than their enemy, as the Jesuits had every reason to hate and, uh, hate and revenge the Catholic Church, having been so shamefully disbanded and suppressed in 1773 by the decree of Pope Clement XIV. Next, we must consider that despite his brilliance, at the time he founded the Illuminati, Weishaupt was just 28 years old. Now, the intelligent reader will at once appreciate that Weishaupt, although a professor of law, could hardly have been the supremo behind this powerful order known as the Illuminati, and as so many historians have naively suggested. Another curious fact is that on February 15, 1775, Cardinal Braschi was elected Pope Pius VI. This pope was a former pupil of the Jesuits, and he desired the release of Father Ritchie, the Jesuit general, and his fellow Jesuits from the prison at Castle St. Angelo. But Charles III of Spain insisted on their detention. Weishaupt's order was formed on May 1st, 1776, a, a, a little over a year after Charles's refusal. We must also ask, if Weishaupt was so anti-Pope and hated the Catholic Church that much, why was it that when Adam Weishaupt was at last laid to rest, he was given a full Catholic burial? 
for all this purported plans to bring about the destruction of the Catholic Church and the, and the public uh, condemnation of his order, the Jesuit order, by Pope Pius VI, Weishaupt was never excommunicated from the Roman Catholic Church. In fact, on the contrary, at his death in November 18, 1830, the Catholic Church proudly proclaimed Weishaupt her faithful son, saying that he had been, quote, reconciled with the Catholic Church, which as, which as a youthful professor he had doomed to death and destruction, unquote. This late-life reconciliation to the Roman Catholic Church and the lack of any steps to take uh, steps taken to excommunicate a man whose alleged lifelong mission was the destruction of the Catholic Church speaks for itself. It's even admitted that Weishaupt, before his death, became a zealous supporter of and helped build up the Roman Catholic Church in Gotha. So says the Chronicle of the Catholic Parish in Gotha, Germany. Weishaupt served his church faithfully, just as Adolf Hitler did. Okay? On the surface, Hitler looked like an enemy of the Roman Catholic Church when all the time he was working for the papacy. Adam Weishaupt was just... As far as I'm concerned, Adam Weishaupt just served a model for Adolf Hitler. Hitler pulled the same trick. It worked for Adam Weishaupt, and it worked for Hitler. And Hitler was buried with full Catholic recognition. And I read the quote from from Spanish dictator Tito uh, 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 Franco, how he was lauded by the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church just couldn't find words to laud him enough. That was the true position of the Vatican toward Adolf Hitler, but it couldn't that praise could not come from the Vatican. It had to come from one of her agents to give the Vatican deniability, plausible deniability. Anyway, uh, P.D. Stewart writes, See, reader, how ludicrous the whole matter appears when analyzed but just a little. Indeed, the Catholic Encyclopedia under the heading Illuminati makes this fascinating admission. Quote, For his prototype, he, that is Adam Weishaupt, relied mainly on Freemasonry, in accordance with which he modeled the degrees and the ceremonial rites of his order, after the pattern of the Society of Jesus, though distorted to the point of caricature as essential features, he built up the strictly hierarchical organization of his society, unquote. To hide its essential Jesuit nature, no doubt. Now this, this is strict, this was right out of the Roman Catholic Encyclopedia. In other words, when the Jesuit imago was suppressed in 1773, the Illuminati order became the chrysalis for a new, more virulent form of Jesuitism, the pseudo-metamorphosis, the author calls it, a pseudo or a fake transformation. Once a Jesuit, always a Jesuit. And just like an opossum, when it becomes necessary to fake one's death to, to survive, that's what a possum does, and that's what the Jesuits did. Adam Weishaupt just brought him back to life again. Only this time more virulent than ever before, with the cover of Freemasonry. Now, I am condemned to the nth degree forever saying anything negative about Freemasonry. But the truth makes much more sense than the facade put forth by Freemasonry. And this country and the world needs to investigate the Jesuit roots between Freemasonry and Illuminism or Jesuitism because they're one and the same. You know, it's interesting. Freemasonry, in order to become a member in the Freemasonic Lodge, you must believe in a supreme deity. But interestingly, you can call him by whatever name you choose. 
That's right. The only requirement is that you believe in a supreme deity. They refer to him blatantly as the grand architect of the universe. I wonder what this grand architect is building, after all. Um, God seems to have done a finished work in the creation, but the Freemasons are building something. wonder what that could be. Could it be the same thing that the Jesuit order is building? An earthly kingdom? That's what Freemasonry is all about. They're hooked at the tails with Jesuitism. They're the enemy of mankind. Now, granted, at the base of Freemasonry, the entry levels of Freemasonry don't have a clue what Freemasonry is really all about. They join the club to be in a good old boy society. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. We'll do good things. We'll get a good reputation for Freemasonry. We'll put out the great public front of charity, altruism, community-based service. See what wonderful charitable men we are as we ride down the street in our little go-karts and and uh, with our little beanie hats on. We make these uh, wonderful burn units for children. We're just the greatest thing since mom and apple pie and baseball. But by the way, if you've ever noticed, when you drive past a Masonic Lodge, there are no windows in the lodge. Wonder what they think is well. Why is it so secret? If they're such a charitable organization, they love to be splattered on the front page of the magazines and newspapers for all their charitable activities. Why is it that they uh, don't have any windows in their buildings? Are they afraid of what America might see if they looked in and see what the 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 ancients do in the dark? If America knew what took place in those Freemasonic institutions, they'd howl them out of town. Why? Because they serve their own grand architect. He's building a new world order for the Pope. They've managed to recruit Protestants to serve a grand design for Satan's man in the world, the biblical Antichrist, the Pope of Rome. And if Freemasonry at the lower levels could ever comprehend how they are being used as pack mules by Rome, by their own Freemasonic hierarchy, there would be a civil war in Freemasonry, the likes of which has never been seen in this country. As misdirected as they are, I believe that the reality ever sunk in, the lower levels, the numerous lower levels of Freemasonry, that, that group that makes up the bulk of the membership of Freemasonry, would put a permanent end to their diabolical hierarchy and that they would expose how their organization and all their charitable efforts have been used to overthrow Protestantism. If God be merciful, let the lower levels of Freemasonry renounce their oaths, demit from the lodge, and expose the diabolical nature of Freemasonry at the top. May God inspire them to, to, to investigate deeply into their so-called charitable order and find out just who it is they serve. Because this, this book leaves little room for doubt and many, many, many other books leave little room for doubt that Freemasonry at the top is merely Jesuitism in disguise for the purpose of destroying Protestantism and every Protestant form of government and Protestants themselves. Now, 
this metamorphosis has taken place. While the Jesuits appear for all intents and purposes to be dead, they use one of their order as a put as a as an apparent enemy to create an underground and the Jesuits go underground in the Illuminati and resurface in Freemasonry and all the other secret societies in this country. We already talked about the Greek lettered sororities, the the literary orders, the literary societies and all the Ivy League schools. They're just recruiting grounds for the Illuminati. And it says per but perhaps the strongest proof that Weishaupt was a Jesuit throughout the suppression comes from his main collaborator and closest associate, the influential Freemason and lawyer, Baron Nike. He's also known as Philo, who on April 20th, Hitler's birthday, by the way, on April 20th, 1784, resigned from the Illuminati, convinced of Adam Weishaupt's Jesuitism, accusing him of being, quote, a Jesuit in disguise. Indeed, Weishaupt once, once wrote, quote, Behold our secret. The end justifies the means. That's straight out of the Jesuit handbook. The end justifies the means. And no marvel, for the Jesuits also have as their first and greatest motto, the end justifies the means, one of their most diabolical maxims. So there's another connection to Freemasonry. Tupper Saucy in his work, Rulers of Evil, also expresses the view that the founder of the Illuminati, Adam Weishaupt, was under orders from the Jesuit general, Lorenzo Ricci. It says, the author of that book does not give the same reasons I have, yet it was encouraging to see that someone else had decided to think for themselves and not simply accept the official mantra on so important a historical development as the creation of the Illuminati. Now, under the heading of Reform of an Older Order, he writes, Another little considered fact is that at the time when Loyola established the, Je uh, the Jesuits, there already existed a sect called the Alambrados, or the Enlightened, or in Illumined, which was a secret mystic movement in Spain during the 16th and 17th centuries. All right, the point here is made... I will add that they would like us to believe that the Illuminati was created in 1773. Excuse me, 1776. And it didn't exist prior to that. But we know that it did in Spain. It was called the Spanish Alambrados in the 16th and 17th century. And he, and he continues... And as we read earlier, Loyola was put in jail for being a member of the Spanish Illuminati, the Alambrados. Quote, Ignatius was suspected of being a member of the Illuminati and was thrown into prison by the Inquisition. Upon his release, he made his way to Salamanca, the great university, but being suspected of Illuminism, was again thrown into prison. So twice, and if I'm not mistaken, in all total, three times he was thrown into prison and questioned by the, the, the Holy Roman Inquisition for being involved in a diabolical Spanish secret society known as the, the Alambrados. Adam Weishaupt, or excuse me, Ignatius Loyola, was, had Extremely nefarious beginnings. Tw three, two times already admitted by this author, but I've read accounts of three times he was thrown in prison and interrogated for his involvement in the Illuminati, Spanish Illuminati. And the author continues, he says, Thus, contrary to accepted opinion, the Illuminati did not begin with Adam Weishaupt, but had already been a major influence in Jesuitism from the time of the Society of Jesus when it was founded by Ignatius Loyola. In fact, Leopold Engel says that Weishaupt was the head of the revived order of the Illuminati. That's a quote. The revived order of the Illuminati. 
Indeed, Weishaupt himself originally claimed that the Illuminati originated with the Zoroastrian religion of the last king of Persia, uh, Yad, Yadzigar III, who was lived from 632 to 651 B.C. So the Illuminati is ancient. The Illumined Ones, if we search this far enough, I'm sure we'll find its origins way back at the Tower of Babel and promulgated through the ancient Babylonian and Persian mystery schools. And that's where you'll find the beginnings of Freemasonry, too. Many Freemasonic books trace their heritage all the way back to the Tower of Babel. They're called the Builders. And isn't it funny? The Bible uses a phrase similar to this. I don't have it right in front of me. But he said, uh, speaking of Christ... He is the stone that the builders rejected. Christ is the stone that the builders rejected. And the same has become the head of the corner. Now, the Illuminati think they're going to put Antichrist as the capstone of their pyramid. But my Bible clearly says He will be destroyed, and he will become the head of the corner. Christ himself will become the head of the corner. Until that day comes, the world is going to be deceived, and a large part of that deception comes from Freemasonry, Illuminati, and all the secret societies that are told, at least, at the bottom that they're building a Christian society, when indeed they're simply erecting a massive structure for Satan himself. See you tomorrow on Inquisition Update. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on satellite, internet, or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom, that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn, the Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, 
I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit crosstheborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's crossthe-border.org.